Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Conan Chong. I'm Assistant Curator for Southeast Asia at the Asian Civilizations Museum, uh, and I'll be your host uh, this evening. Welcome to the second installment of ACM Talks. ACM Talks, uh, supported by the Chris Foundation, takes place on the third Thursdays of every month from 7 to 8 p.m. Singapore time and brings uh, leading scholars in conversation with curators at ACM to explore our core curatorial themes, maritime trade, faith and belief, and uh, materials and design. So for our uh, second installment tonight, we have Dr. Paul Hedges uh, with Interreligious Encounters in the Museum, Religious Borders and Crossings in Art and Artifacts. Dr. Hedges is Associate Professor in the Interreligious Relations and Plural Societies Program, RSIS, Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. His research areas include interreligious studies, comparative theology, and theory and method in the study of religion. He has published widely with his two latest books being Understanding Religion, Theories and Methods for Studying Religiously Diverse Societies, published by California University Press uh, in 2021, and uh, Religious Hatred, Prejudice, Islamophobia, and Anti-Semitism in Global Context, uh, published uh, by Bloomsbury Academic uh, in 2021. So just a note on the structure of today's talk before we begin, um, Dr. Hedges will speak for half an hour, uh, and then uh, he and I will engage in a 15 minute uh, response and dialogue, in um, sort of in re response to his talk. And we will finish with a 15, 15 minute uh, Q&A, taking questions from, from you, the audience. Um, so please feel free to type in your questions uh, at any time in the Q&A chat box. You can click the Q&A button uh, at the bottom of your screen and just type in your questions. Um, and you can also upvote questions you want to see answered, and then we will take them uh, at the end of the session. So uh, without further delay, um, let me invite uh, Dr. Hedges, please, to start. Okay, thank you very much, um, Conan, for that kind introduction. Um, and I'd like to begin by thanking the ACM um, for inviting me to give this talk, and especially sort of Conan as my interlocutor tonight. Um, and uh, also the director of the museum and the Chris Foundation who have made this series possible. Now, I'll divide this talk into three sections, as you can see here, um, starting off with a selection of mainly Buddhist images, um, showing some changes across time and place, before going into a discussion of what the term religion means and its Western and colonial history, um, which we'll seek to unpick. After this, I will end by coming back to some more images, Buddhist, Christian and Hindu amongst others, and talking about the interreligious crossings that they represent. So part A, a plethora of images set in the scene. I will start with an image, a work of art that struck me the first time I ever visited the AECM, which was a long time before I moved to Singapore. I was on a layover between New Zealand and the UK, and having spent a day in the city, wandering around the museum, I saw this. It's a type of image made around the late 1940s and early 1950s in Nagoya, Japan. During this period, just after World War II, there was a growing fascination with the so-called hidden Christians. Those who had remained Catholic after Christianity was banned in 1639 until it was once again legalized in 1873. For a while, it was believed that these images were used by those hidden Christians as a way to keep their faith alive disguised within a Buddhist representation. However, they were simply the imagined creation of a much later period. As such, this image is not an interreligious encounter, if by that we mean the crossing and enfolding of beliefs and practices across borders of belonging and identity. Rather, it is an imagined representation of what that might look like. Nevertheless, the Buddha on a cross, the Amida Buddha of the Pure Land sitting on a Christian symbol, remains a striking representation that perhaps 
makes us think what might be possible when we unfold two symbologies together. Now I'll return to this image as we proceed, but keeping with the representations of the Buddha, I will take us back around 1,500 years to China and the Eastern Wei Dynasty where we see this image. The accompanying description tells us that this depicts the Buddha, Avalokiteshvara and Maitreya. Despite the time gap between the Buddha on the cross and the figures here, we see a lot of similarity. All are clearly East Asian Buddhist figures. Serene and calm with stylized draping robes and the hands in what are termed mudras, symbolic postures with particular meanings. We might not find this striking, but Buddhist art had moved a long way from its early origins, learning deeply from sources to the West and in India. To see this change, let us look at a few more images before we stop and think about some of this. So first, not from the ACM, but an early image of the Buddha. Okay, you may be asking, where is the Buddha? Well, if you know how Buddhist art evolved, you will note that at first, Buddhist artists resisted actually showing physical representations of him. For several centuries, all that was shown was perhaps the Bodhi tree, under which he sat to obtain awakening, or an empty seat where he may have been teaching, or just a footprint as we see here. Indeed, the Buddha's footprint remains an important Buddhist symbol today. And when we first see material representations of the Buddha and Bodhisattvas, we see something like this. Now, as you may be aware, the earliest anthropomorphic human images that we know of the Buddha appear in a place to the northwest of the Indian subcontinent known as Gandhara. It was an important early Buddhist centre, but it was also where the Macedonian Emperor Alexander the Great reached in his attempt at world domination. He intended to set up new cities in his conquests, and so artisans and craftsmen followed his armies. And here, in Central Asia, a fusion of Greek and Buddhist cultures and worldviews met. For the Greeks, it was only natural that deities should be portrayed in human form. And adapting this, we see the earliest Buddha and Bodhisattva statues looking like Greco-Roman gods, like an Apollo. Elsewhere in Asia, as Buddhism spread, this human representation remained against the early aniconic or anti-representational attitude. And so we see Buddhist images that will be familiar to us in many places such as these. Now, so far I've shown you a lot of images which show mainly different cultural regional expressions of how Buddhist art has adapted to its surroundings. To borrow some language from Christian missiology, it has enculturated into new environments. Nothing particularly controversial here. A walk through the ACM or many museums will readily garner this information. However, I want to suggest that we're actually seeing dynamic and syncretic border crossings taking place. So these do not, at least in these Buddhist images, imply a crossing of religious borders in the way we might commonly imagine. Part B, decolonizing religion, decolonizing our minds. If I ask you if Buddhism is a religion, I might get a range of answers. Let me suggest some. For a start, when you fill in your census form, it's one of the options you can tick. Of course, you can only tick one box, and let's keep that in mind. It's one of Singapore's 10 major religious traditions represented in such places as the IRO, Singapore's interreligious organization. So in lots of ways, it looks like, operates as, and is treated as a religion. However, some other people may say, well, Buddhism is more of a philosophy. It doesn't have a God, certainly not a created deity. Again, they may say it's a way of life. However, all of these answers only take us so far. Actually, religions do not exist. Religions do not exist. Now, let me unpack that a bit more and say that religions do not exist as a natural part of our world. And by this, I mean that they do not name a set of things in the way that we might typically imagine. So how we might typically think about religion. 
things with scripture, a founder, and a set of teachings emanated from this. Worlds of meaning, which shape the experience of believers, such that we can only belong meaningfully and coherently to any single one. Founded institutional organizations with distinct rituals and practices that differ between each. Possessing distinct sets of deities or ultimate realities or a supreme deity or ultimate reality as part of a unique cosmological worldview. <clears throat> if we travel back in time around 500 years, we would not find a language in which we could express the set of meanings that we've seen here that are part of the modern English concept of religion. So let us think about some language families and their related religions with that term very much in scare quotes as we see them in Singapore. So let's start with Islam and Arabic. Often when tra translated into English, the Arabic word deen is translated as religion, but it means something more like culture or custom. Certainly it does not denote an institutional tradition and its beliefs and practices. Again, with Hinduism and Sanskrit, we see the term Dharma, often again translated as religion. And while a term with many meanings, its primary one is duty, and it relates to your position within life and how this entails you should live out your daily experience. When we come to Chinese, we do find a cognate term, Zongjiao. But this term was first coined in Japan in the 19th century. This was after Western gunboats opened Japan to the world and demanded they restructure their society after Western norms. But there was no native term that equated to religion, and so they coined one, which was then taken up in Chinese. And it fixes together two terms, meaning something like ancestral rites and traditions or teachings. And in medieval Europe, there was, of course, the Latin term religio, from which we get religion, on which there is no agreed etymology. But then it denoted something like piety in modern English. With the Reformation, when Catholic and Protestant forms of Christianity split, it became possible which had not been possible in the medieval world, to speak of two forms of piety, Catholic and Protestant religions. Then from around the 17th century, as Europeans moved out beyond their own marginal position at the Western end of Eurasian landmass, they encountered worldviews and thought systems very different from their own and essentially unknown to them. To make sense of this, this concept religion and similarly in other European languages, started denoting a set of distinct traditions along the lines seen in the definition here, a process solidified by about the mid 19th century. Now, this tour through the etymology of an English language term and its lack of equivalence elsewhere may seem far removed from the artistic images that I've been discussing, but it has very important consequences for how we think about these images and what they represent. While today we may see it as normal that Buddhist art took on to cultural forms of different regions as it moved, we may suggest that what was still represented by this was the religious meaning of Buddhism. However, to say this requires that we can make a division between religion and culture. And to the people making this art, this was simply not a conceptual distinction they could make and almost certainly would not understand. Now, let's think about this by talking about how we imagine religion within the Chinese cultural world. Today, we may think of its religions as Buddhism, Taoism, Confucianism, and Chinese folk traditions as distinct religious pathways. Um, and if some of you are saying Confucianism is not a religion, for the moment, I'll give two short answers. First, if we go a few miles across the border into Indonesia, it is one of the six officially recognized religions there. Um, and also through most of Chinese history, it provided the ritual basis of the worship of Tien or heaven for the emperor. Um, so if you like, it had qualities we'd normally ascribe as religious. Now, while everyone in Singapore only gets to tick one box under census, those of you with friends or relatives who adhere to Chinese religious practices, or if you do yourselves, will surely have noticed that many people will as readily go to the Taoist temple 
as the Buddhist one, and they'll go into the folk temples as they pass those and happily stop to pray in all of these places. Now, this behavior had long worried Western scholars who thought that it was a sign that the Chinese either didn't take religion seriously, had got it wrong, or were simply confused. But this was because of the dominant model of religion, which relied upon a Western and particularly modern Protestant model, such as the one here, focusing on texts, authorizing certain beliefs, and hence adherence to one at a time. But religion, or those things we term religions, may look very different elsewhere. And the Chinese model is one that I have described as strategic religious participation in a shared religious landscape. Let me repeat that. Strategic religious participation in a shared religious landscape. People would see no contradiction in asking a Buddhist monk to perform a family funeral, employing a celestial master's Taoist to do an exorcism, conforming to Confucian social mores and praying at the village shrine. And if this person was a literati official, also performing the Confucian rites for the spirits of the earth. Participation in religious practices took priority over believing specific teachings. But it was also assumed that there was enough commonality, a shared religious landscape that justified such seeming border crossings. And importantly, this was not just folk custom, it was justified by elite traditions. Chuenzhen Taoism explicitly combined Buddhist, Taoist and Confucian texts in its scriptural corpus. And emperors would issue edicts asserting the harmony of what are called the three traditions or San Jiao. And explicit traditions combine into worship and practices of all three of Taoism, Buddhism and Confucianism existed. Now, this is not only a facet of Chinese religiosity and today across East, Southeast and South Asia, we see similar practices of crossing what we today perceive as religious borders. And famously in Singapore, along Waterloo Street, you'll see Hindus just as avidly offering prayers at the Guan Yin Temple as they do at the Hindu Temple, while the Novena Catholic Church has also long been a favoured spot for Hindu devotion. You will also see Taoists engage in the Tai Kusam procession. Crossing and shared participation has been the normal religious behaviour, as far as we can make out, for most of human history. To think of religions as discrete territories with their own beliefs, which determine practices and belonging, is to think via an imposed Western model. Now, one potential question here is whether it's maybe not just Western and Protestant, whether it applies more broadly to those traditions which uh, claim a lineage to sort of Abraham, most notably Christianity, Islam and Judaism. Now, to some extent, this model works more easily across these traditions, but it's not a perfect fit. And so, for instance, just to mention traditional Islamic thought, the notion of the Ar al kitab the people of the book, and the related status of Ar al zimma or protected people or Zimis, relates largely to those traditions we term religions. But to be acknowledged as people of the book, put the people so labelled within a prophetic lineage and of a text that was seen as part of the same tradition, the same revealed tradition, as the Quran. It didn't make it a separate discrete sphere, at least not conceptually. While in the Sant tradition of North India, Muslims, Hindus and Sikhs often revered the same saints and offered devotions at the same shrines, seeing a common bond of piety. Part C, rethinking religious borders and meanings. Now, when we come back to our statues and images, this will give us pause to think. Religions, as religions, do not like to be thought of as syncretic. Christian theological categories have made this term suspect and smacking of erroneous innovation. However, every religion is, and always has been, syncretic. They have learned and adopted from traditions that existed before them and borrowed from meetings with new cultural forms. And if we inhabited a shared religious landscape where we engage in strategic religious participation, this seems perfectly natural. Only 
when we impose the Western colonial category of religion on our thinking, do we start to see such borrowing as problematic. This is not to say that similar ideas could not develop elsewhere, and Salafi thought in Islam strives for similar purity, but it's also, of course, a modern religious innovation. So let's go back to some of our statues and take a look. Some may say that what we see here is only three different cultural expressions of Buddhism, but retaining the core religion in what is meant. But this is to apply that modern colonial category to the statues and how we interpret them. Moreover, we cannot so easily make a division between what we see and what we think. Ideas and our embodiment as human beings are not distinct. This could be unpacked further, but suffice it to say that images, sensory experiences and physical environments play a huge part in how we think and what we think, far more than we often realise. Importantly, the art also shows us a conceptual change has occurred. Before, the ineffability of the Buddha's experience was seen as unrepresentable, but in the later art, it's seen as capable of being shown. Indeed, as Buddhist art developed, very precise requirements became mandated in terms of how the Buddha was presented, such that through seeing the statue, we could see into the realm of Nirvana itself. Now, this idea has some similarities um, with Hindu aesthetics, where in Darshan, inadequately translated as worship, we both see the deity and are seen by the deity. The physical form itself partakes to or points to the reality um, it's seen to sort of represent. Now, I don't want to say that the artistic forms led to this development, but as what became known as Mahayana Buddhism developed, the state of Nirvana is said to be not separable from samsara, our current, current physical reality of lived experience. Whereas it seems that in both early Buddhist traditions and modern Theravada Buddhism, Nirvana, our release and awakening, is held to be utterly distinct from samsara, which would justify the aniconic approach, notwithstanding that Theravada devotion, as much as Mahayana, embraces devotion to statues. Now, two further examples can be noted showing some changes, but in different ways. First, being in East or Southeast Asia, it's hardly possible to think about religious imagery without mention of Guan Yin. Now, we've seen her already as Avalokiteshvara, but for around the last thousand years, she has most paradigmatically been known across much of Asia and her female form is seen here. The story of her passage into this form is fascinating, but need not detain us. But what is important is that as Guan Yin, she is not just a bodhisattva, but also a Chinese goddess. She is as readily found in Taoist and Chinese folk temples as in Buddhist ones. While her infinite compassion is extolled scripturally in the Lotus Sutra, she exists an object of devotion far beyond the confines of Buddhist orthodoxy. And this is entirely natural and not unexpected in a shared religious landscape. If we retain the captive mind, to use the evocative phrase of Malay sociologist Said Hussein Halatus, to speak of the enthrallment to which previously colonised peoples have to the ideas and worldviews of those who once colonised them, though we may ask why a Buddhist figure is in a Taoist temple. But to ask if she is still a Buddhist figure or only a Buddhist figure makes little sense in a traditional context. I turn now to the figure of Jesus. This is undoubtedly one of the most famous and graphic portrayals of Jesus on the cross. It was originally placed within the chapel of a hospital for patients suffering from terrible skin diseases known as St John's fire. And there patients could see their God suffering with them with Jesus's pain fully portrayed. However, for around the first 500 years of Christian tradition, we can find no images of the crucifixion. And when Jesus does start to be portrayed on the cross, we also see something very different, a representation of Jesus in glory. This fitted with the belief embodied in Orthodox Christian teaching that Jesus as God could not suffer. While it was not our role to see him in our suffering and he in ours, 
but rather to see ourselves redeemed through victory over death. These different depictions of Jesus therefore show very different theological ideas. And as Christianity moved to Asia, it was natural that Asian forms would develop. I say natural, but many European Christians and those influenced by European Christianity have often opposed this. When European Christians came here with the power of the gun and the sword, the cross was seen as part of a matrix in which Western cultural forms were seen as superior. Hence, when you walk around Singapore, you'll find a skyline dotted with Gothic churches and their spires. Now, while for well over 100 years, Christianity has adapted Asian forms of art and architecture, and long before this in Christianity's non-Western forms in Asia, this is still contested by some. And this enculturation may involve built-in churches more towards the local style, and some of you may be familiar with this one, um, which has a somewhat Chinese flavour, but it also applies in art. And so we see Jesus represented in Asian or indigenous art forms. Yet at the same time in Asia, he's also often been depicted in ways that represent Western styles of art as well, as seen in this San um, Pieta and crucified Jesus. And a key discussion amongst many Christians has been to the degree to which images of Jesus can take on indigenous forms. Now, to return to one image I just showed you, here, the Indian Christian artist Jayati Sahi has deliberately employed indigenous Indian forms. And those of you familiar with Hindu iconography will at once see the resonance with Shiva Nataraja, Shiva as Lord to dance. I'm not sure if it's familiar to my Singapore audience, but at primary school in the UK, where we were required to have acts of Christian worship in a secular school system, make of that what you will, we often sang the Christian hymn, Lord of the Dance, which has been part inspired by the Nataraja imagery, with an understanding that Jesus too is a Lord of the Dance. But for many, such an image is deeply controversial. It may be seen as taking syncretic religious symbols which do not belong to Christianity. Now, I won't here enter into any theological disputes on this matter, but they're out there. Now, a statue like this is perhaps less controversial. We see Jesus and Mary in an indigenous um, form, and its acceptability or not relates to particular notions of religion and culture and how we interpret that. But regardless of how we view it, there has been a huge amount of sharing within art and a dialogue, I might say, in which cultures, religions and traditions, or howsoever we named them, have believed that they can see a deity and sum supreme reality being represented. Now, let me put a few images side by side. I don't have time to go into the details of these images, but we see Jesus, Ganesh and the Buddha. And I'd like to point to some common aspects. First, the halo. This might seem quite mundane, but perhaps three and a half thousand years across the Eurasian landmass and beyond, the special nature of certain figures has been represented by light emanating from them, which can be the halo or nimbus around the head or mandala around the whole body. But it tells us something about the way that many traditions have felt that divine claims of their figures can be equated with the divine claims of other figures. Of course, this may not be about equality, it could be a claim of supremacy if one figure is seen as higher or superseding the others. But a wide usage tells us it is not inappropriate for divinity of one tradition and their divine light to be seen in ways in which deities of another tradition have previously been represented. But also, look at the hands. Jesus is in what is often termed the traditional Greek teacher's position, but it's strikingly like a mudra, those hand positions of the Buddha, and in Hindu art as well. And we know Indian religious teachers were found across the Greek world and Roman Empire, Buddhist monks within in Egypt at various times, and figures such as Pythagoras drew heavily from India in developing their spirituality. Again, we may think of Pythagoras as a mathematician or a philosopher, but Greek philosophers are much more like what in today's language we might call religious teachers. And so while we cannot be certain of a lineage, it does seem to make 
sense when we know about these connections. Now, another set of images. And here we see a pose that may be familiar as Jesus and Mary. But for the early viewers, what they would have seen is on the bottom left here or bottom right, I'm depending on which way your screen goes, the Isis and Horus pairing, that divine mother and son. And it's recently been taken up in Hindu art as well, a way to represent the divine mother and son across traditions. Now, I have not made an argument that we see essentially the same thing portrayed across religious and cultural worlds. Clearly we don't. What Christians want to say when they put a halo on Jesus or put Mary and Jesus together is different from what Hindus want to say when they put a halo on Ganesh or what Isis and Horus meant. However, attention to art makes us aware that religious traditions have historically believed in some translatability of ideas across traditions. And let us not forget that for most of history, most humans have been illiterate. So most of our learning as a species and our thinking has been about images and what they tell us more than the ideas and doctrines. Now, in case something that I've only evoked some sense of artistic compatibility or commonality, I'd like to end with a story that shows interreligious learning and dialogue can go deeper. On the 26th of August, Orthodox Christians celebrate the feast of St. Barlam and Josephat, and Catholic Christians celebrate this on the 29th of November. Josephat was a young prince who was convinced by the hermit Barlam against the wishes of his father, to leave his life of worldliness and luxury and become a religious hermit. Eventually, the father also converted. Now, various versions of the legend exist, and it's said that the bones of these saints made their way to India with its association with the Apostle Thomas. And this story entered the European Christian world during the Crusades. But at that time, Barlam and Josephat were not figures of Christian veneration. They were holy figures for Sufis. But Christians, hearing of their piety and devotion, saw no incompatibility with Christianity and adopted them. But the plot thickens. The historians of religion have traced this tale back to Muslims in India who were enamoured of the life of the Buddha and his teachers. Indeed, the Latin name Josephat is a rendition of the Persian Buddhasif, which comes from Bodhisattva, as the Buddha was known before his awakening. Today, therefore, Christians venerate the Buddha and one of his teachers as saints within their own tradition. If we imagine every religion as a discrete and closed box with clear markers, practices and identities hermetically sealed from each other, this story makes no sense. If, however, we decolonize our minds and understand the world's religious history as more marked by a shared religious landscape in which border crossings have been natural and normative, then we won't be surprised. What then of the images and forms shared between religions? If we think of religions as bordered and sealed territories of meaning, then we may think that some common symbolism is simply that. But when we think that the religious sphere has been marked by much sharing of devotional practices and even beliefs across borders, then we're left to wonder how much is signified by even something as seemingly mundane as a halo. Now to finish, I return to the image with which we started. An entirely imaginative image, which played no part in the lives of hidden Christians. For, but for at least some Christians, Buddha Sif, the young Bodhisattva, was seen as somebody whose religious life and practice exemplified following the example of the teacher from Galilee, who died upon the cross. The actual story of religious art and religious practice crosses far more borders than we may imagine. And in every religious artifact, we never see only one tradition exemplified, but instead we see part of a global story of interreligious encounters, sharing, and even we may say dialogue. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Paul, for your very informative uh, lecture and you know for 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 tackling this field of uh, religious art. Um, it, it's really big, it's really very clear that um, these sort of religious and sacred objects have always existed in a, in a kind of shared religious landscape. Uh, and you know, despite the best efforts of 
you know, art historians and, and museum curators today to try and classify them in um, discrete uh, galleries based on how they look. Um, it's, it's really a good reminder that we also have to, to keep in mind sort of the, the lives of the images and sort of the, the way that they've been used and, and approached by um, uh, visitors, by, by, by worshippers as well. Um, and yeah, thanks so much for, for taking that, uh, you know, seeing objects in our collection, our ACM collection through uh, the lens of um, interreligious uh, studies. Um, but so just we just want to take the next um, let's say 10, 15 minutes uh, to have a little, just a, just a kind of dialogue with, uh, between myself and, and uh, Paul. Um, and, uh, but in the meantime, you know, we'll take the, the last uh, 15 minutes, we will uh, take questions from the audience. So please uh, type in your questions in the Q&A box uh, and, and uh, in, in, in about 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes, we'll, we'll take them. Um, but so I just wanted to, to uh, you know, bring us back to uh, the institution of, of the museum of ACM, and, and you know why actually that why actually we are so interested uh, in this notion of interreligious dialogue. Why we've uh, kind of asked uh, Paul to kindly give his uh, talk today. Um, the context of, of this is really for ACM. Uh, we, we've just finished a, a really long uh, 25 million uh, revamp of all our galleries, uh, which which began in 2014, uh, and and part of this refresh was the development of the uh, faith and belief galleries on the second floor. So if you've been to ACM before, um, I'm just going to flash some images, uh, you know, including the, the Christian art gallery, which is the, really the first permanent gallery in a museum dedicated to Christian art uh, made or used in, in Asia. Uh, the Islamic uh, art in the Islamic world gallery, which is one of the few in the world to really foreground uh, Islamic practice in Southeast Asia. Um, and, and of course, the, uh, the, the ancient uh, religion gallery for Buddhism and Hinduism. And we also have um, uh, galleries dedicated to uh, scholar studio, uh, Confucian practices and, and uh, uh, ancestors and ritual practices in, in the region in Southeast Asia. So we've really taken this kind of global art histories um, uh, approach. Um, but you know, having finished uh, our, our, our sort of revamp of the, the galleries, uh, we've been thinking a lot more seriously about the role that the museum, the ACM can play in uh, interreligious dialogue, uh, having such rich collections of uh, sacred and religious art, and, you know, having also ambitions to kind of represent uh, all the 10 major religions um, uh, in the, the IRO and interreligious uh, organization in, in Singapore. Um, and, you know, in fact, um, community, this idea of uh, trying to um, facilitate uh, community harmony is not new to the museum. Uh, when we were when we were kind of founded in 1997, uh, our, our mission was to kind of represent the so-called uh, ancestral cultures in Singapore, with each culture kind of marked by uh, ethnicity and, and religion, of course. Um, so so just to kind of throw up this uh, ICOM definition of the museum, of course, uh, it's been uh, challenged in in. in uh, uh, recent years in 19, but um, it's still at least it's representative of, of uh, one definition of the museum. And I just want to highlight the part um, where it says that the museum is is uh, meant for to be in service of society, uh, to be open to the public. Um, and and so, yeah, so the ACM in this role, uh, you know, in its responsibility to, to serve the society, to serve um, community harmony. Um, just want to um, to ask you, Paul. Um, you know, even especially what you've said um, earlier on. Uh, your you you kind of uh, established that at least on a on a theoretical level, uh, religion doesn't exist. Uh, it's in the sense that it doesn't naturally occur. In a, uh, but um, you know, in our society, Singapore uh, and, and the rest of the world, religions as kind of distinct bounded entities, of course, um, clearly play a role in how we organize our everyday. Uh, life, how society is organized, and in the museum, it's, it's how we, we organize our galleries. Uh, and I just wanted to ask, um, you know, coming off from this, uh, you know, what role, you know, does the museum take in maintaining religious harmony in, in Singapore? How does it, you know, in the constellation of uh, state involvement and state uh, 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 sort of uh, involvement in, in maintaining religious harmony, where does the museum as itself a national museum, a state and secular institution, what, what is our role? Uh, and, and coming off of that, you know, how can we 
participate in, in this broader interfaith movement uh, separate from this uh, state function. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Um, excellent set of questions there, um, Conan. Um, as you say, you know, I said in one sort of theoretical sense, sort of, you know, religions have a particular uh, construct and it's sort of, if you like, sort of the modern sort of Western lineage, which has given us the way we, we envisage um, what they are today. Um, but of course, what gets included differs from place to place. So I said, like in Indonesia, Confucianism would count as religion. It doesn't normally count as one here. Um, again, in some places, you know, people say Buddhism religion, other places, you know, they'll say it's not religion, dependent upon the definition um, that you're using for this. Now, having said that, as you said, like in many sort of practical ways, you know, these are divisions that people recognise, that they, they work with um, in various ways. Um, and of course, this has to be, if you like, sort of respected in terms of how people are, are understand themselves and they interact and of course there are organizations um, built around these particular traditions. Now hopefully sort of something the museum can sort of do um, is providing this if like a space where people can come and talk about sort of if you like the overlap between their sort of traditions um, and maybe because of course in the museum we see what is seen as if you like art you know Statues for the Buddha it may be presented like as really devotional items, like sort of Hindu statues or sort of other objects from other traditions. Um, but if like in the museum, they kind of like have a more secular sort of life as as objects of art, and so it becomes perhaps less threatening for people if like to discuss some of the similarities or crossovers that they see um, when it's framed as a discussion around sort of art itself, um, rather than if you like sort of seen as coming to sort of you know perhaps, you know, to the heart of what they see as their tradition in their lived practice. So, you know, that, that can sort of take place here and people, once you start to see sort of, you know, borders and commonalities with somebody else, you know, it gives you a different way to sort of think about those identities, you know, do we share a history? Um, and you spoke about sort of the museum representing sort of ancestral sort of cultures. Again, if we imagine like each of these cultures is like, you know, being completely distinct, then you say, well, what brings us together? If you show that there's been a lot of sort of overlap over time, then you start to sort of see, well, actually, we already share much, you know, even before we start talking, we share a lot of ideas. Thanks, thanks, Paul. That's, that's really striking the way that you've described, um, like sort of the museum kind of functioning, because we we give we kind of give people permission to uh, view the these religious objects as works of art rather mm -hmm. than as like kind of embodied works of religion. So they kind of um, instead of uh, uh, it's it's almost like it makes me think of what you were saying with the kind of sh the notion of a shared religious landscape, with the Chinese you know Buddhism, Taoism, and and uh, where Buddhism, Taoism, and and uh, uh, Confucianism, and folk religions can kind of coexist. Uh, in a way, this is I mean the museum kind of creates a shared it's a shared landscape in a way, but not particularly religious in one sense. It it kind of just provides a, a, a almost like a secular a shared secular uh, landscape in a sense. Um, for that kind of dialogue. Yes, absolutely. I mean, of course, I mean, the museums sort of as they are set up, they are designed, if you like, as secular institutions and maybe it's not a place to go into this. Um, but of course, yeah. the, sort of the modern museum, it comes out of the sort of the Western Enlightenment idea, um, sort of 16th, 17th, sort of 18th, sort of century, 19th century, these things are being set up um, and they're there you know, I mean, partly to sort of show a, uh, if you like, a, a secular sort of space where we can come and sort of see, you know, these common bits of, of heritage. Um, but also in that it's also a little bit sort of conflicted as how it relates to religion as well. As I said, if you like this enlightenment and secular idea, there's, there's also a Northern European Protestant sort of heritage behind it. Um, and of course, one part of this was placing religious items into museums, um, you know, it was to take away any sort of sacred status they may have. So, you know, it simply becomes art there. You can look at it as art, it sort of becomes safe. And if you like, particularly for Protestants, many of whom, um, you know, are, are not inclined towards sort of having sort of, you know, religious forms of art within within their churches, you know, it's fine to look at them in the museum. 
Um, so partly it sort of was a Protestant again, sort of Catholic thing. You see, you know, your devotion and, and your relics there actually belong in a museum. Um, they become a safe space. Um, and again, of course, of the colonial enterprise as well, that, you know, sort of, um, you know, their sort of works of art are sort of put here. So they become, if you like, part of this secular enlightenment sort of framing. So yes, it does provide, if you like, this, as you said, a safe secular space. Um, but that, of course, itself is, is part of another story as to how we come and, and think about these objects and, of course, treat them in museums and the way we normally look at them. Well, that, that, thanks a lot. And that actually leads kind of neatly into the next thing I wanted to bring up, which was, you know, kind of this, despite the museum's or, or best efforts to impose a, a kind of secular uh, enlightenment framework on, on lots of religious art, and this in itself is a kind of, it is a form of, uh, uh, yeah, uh, col of colonization, of, of kind of reproducing these uh, categories. Um, you know, the, sometimes images themselves have, have uh, agency, or seem to have agency, um, by, by the religious communities that, that venerate them. So if, for example, uh, this sculpture of the Hindu goddess Kali is in, in some ways seen as an avatar of that, uh, an, an embodiment of that goddess. And, and you know, for, for, some, for many Hindus, maybe she can't be seen purely as a, a secular object. Um, and just this other example, you know, when um, 2016, the museum was uh, fortunate enough to take on loan the Buddha image from uh, Bagan in Myanmar which in Myanmar is seen to have, uh, was, was believed to have kind of wishful. And in the museum in Myanmar itself, um, the, the museum staff often um, brings to it in the gallery itself. So in, in these, um, you know, how, how does the, the agency of these religious images actually complicate their use, you know, their, their, instru their instrumentality as a uh, facilitator? Yeah, I get that. That's a really fantastic sort of uh, question. Sort of thanks for that, Conan. Um, and partly, I think this is a related to the way that sort of, if you like, sort of, we've come to understand sort of in academic terms, but also sort of more broadly, um, what's sometimes called, if you like, the material turn. And you're talking about like the agency of objects. Um, because again, of course, in this very sort of enlightenment sort of secular idea, we prioritize, if you like, sort of words and, and language. So we go in there you know, like to see something and, and, and to think about it. Um, but of course, if you like to, to, the space of the museum itself, you know, shapes the way we're going to interact with that object, the way we see it. Um, so at a, sort of one level of a lot of these objects, of course, traditionally, as they were devotional objects, they would be sort of up above you. You know, you're meant to look up at it like that. But of course, typically in the museum, it's just like they're on the wall, kind of like a painting. Um, so this, this is affected in this, um, and I know that some sort of uh, art galleries and museums around the world have tried, if you like, to sort of create something of a more uh, sort of religious sort of nature um, in this. And I was reading recently about a collection of, of, of icons, um, which was shown in America, um, and there sort of the curator sort of said, you know, I knew I was successful because like people were you know, while well, kissing, I mean, they, were, they had a glass in front, you know, they don't go up and, and they were kissing sort of the glass, like as their way to sort of pay their devotion to these, which, you know, he said, like in another context, the same item was shown, but, you know, there, there was no interaction, there was no devotion to it. Now, of course, that depends what you want to do in your display, whether you want to do that. Um, but yes, I mean, if you want people to actually understand these objects, you know, I mean, a normal museum display is really not perhaps the best way to understand, you know, their meaning to the community. I mean, yes, if you want to do art history, you can go in there, you can look at like, you know, this is what this object is made of, this is a particular sort of history of it, this was the artist, sort of blah, blah, blah. Um, but I said, if you want to say, well, this is what it means to a community, then like a different form of display um, would be useful in this. So yes, I mean, to, to, the way that objects are displayed um, can help do this. And actually, maybe you've mentioned that sort of Kali image, but also in your own sort of display, um, when you first come into your, well, your ancient religions um, room, we could say all sorts about ancient religions um, in this, you have that huge sort of like sort of bodice out of the head, the red sandstone one, I showed this picture earlier. Um, 
And, you know, it's like the sheer power of that object is, is quite clear to you. It's, it's this massive sort of human head. It's there. And, you know, you're kind of like almost overwhelmed by that. So, yes, I mean, sort of ways that I said, you know, people will interact with these objects or the angles they view them. I said all of this will help if you like to understand, you know, what it means to those traditions. Um, and again, I said, like the Kali thing, if people want to understand, well, why is it important sort of to Hindus? You know, again, it's not the art history side it would help. Um, but if you like did this more sort of if like, you know, the, the, the practice, the usage of this um, could, could help come in. And again, museums, perhaps in some displays, they could help sort of facilitate some sense of understanding this. Thanks very much, Paul. Definitely, we, we will definitely keep, take all these things in mind when, while we are developing the galleries further in our, uh, in our future projects. Uh, I think, so we have uh, 10 minutes left and we've got a, quite a few questions that I think perhaps we can take. Um, let's, let's go with um, the first question by Hassan Bauda, who says, who asks if uh, we can share some bit of insight on the difference of dynamics that need to be considered uh, when we think of, I think he's trying to ask um, whether uh, it's different to consider a modern art in the museum, a modern religious art versus um, more older or, or more pre-historical religious art in the museum. Are, are there different uh, considerations in, in play? Um, yes, actually, this maybe sort of comes on from what I was just saying about sort of the ancient uh, religion museum. Um, and again, I said this was often part, I said, of the Enlightenment sort of secular Protestant sort of attitude to put, if you like, religious art in like sort of ancient history to show this was like part of the past and we're moving towards a more rational future. Um, and of course, I said a lot of the images you have like in your ancient room, I mean, they would still be objects of devotion today um, yeah. that, that they're associated with. So I, I don't think the distinction is sort of whether something is old or whether it's modern. Um, Obviously, sort of as a museum, I mean, I, I guess there, you know, it, it, it's, it's the rare, it's the unusual things that sort of come in. But again, if you want to understand sort of particular traditions and the use of these objects, it's, it's not always the age of an object um, which, which matters. Um, and again, sometimes sort of perhaps in, in some sort of Hindu temples, like if a statue is, is replaced, sort of an older statue is replaced by a newer statue, but like the newer statue can be seen to take over some of the, like, of the power um, of that older statue. So age is not always sort of the issue um, around this. Right. Yeah, so you're almost saying it's, it's what the difference between whether the image is consecrated or not, whether it's still ritually, considered ritually efficacious or not, which is something that can't really be, be seen. I mean, at least for a lot of people, we can't just see it from the object itself. It, you need some kind of special expertise or special vision to see that. Uh, well, with it needs some special vision, but again, a lot of this is perhaps sort of tradition specific. So, mm -hmm. I mean, with Hindu statues, yes, there's a particular sort of, I mean, when they're put into the temple, I mean, dotting the eyes and consecrating them in place um, takes place. But I mean, for some traditions, you know, again, like Greek Orthodox icons, you know, it's making process is what has made it efficacious. And that remains no matter where you put it. Um, and again, with some sort of Hindu statues, you know, even if they're taken out of the temple, they may still be considered to have these properties. Of course, you spoke about the one from Myanmar. So, yeah, I mean, this, this sense of efficacious, yes, it, it resides within the tradition which understands this. Um, but, you know, whether it's about consecration, um, whether it's about something else, but also there's the impact on people as well. I mean, we can't sort of take that away. To, you know, some things will have a greater impact on certain people than other people. Um, and, you know, we could go into, you know, things like you know, it's the aesthetics of the object or the display of the object, all, all of this can affect it. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question from, from Luke uh, Matthew Tan. Um, he's asking, you know, he wonders how the museum may challenge the conventional norms of what religion is, especially given how religion religion is has and has been taught in main, mainstream schools. Um, and uh, for example, what words we may use. And I think that kind of leads into, um, I guess, what we were talking about before about um, our, the museum using uh, the terms faith and belief for our religion galleries and you know is there really what is the correct uh, you know it, obviously there isn't a simple answer but what is the best word to use uh, in talking about religion? Yeah that's an excellent question I mean the last few decades if like the academic study of religion has been heavily debating this issue 
Um, there are some scholars who want us to get rid of the term religion altogether, never use it again. Um, there are some, I mean, and I put myself in this camp, who say we can strategically use it. Because to some extent, you know, people in the world relate to these traditions, and if we don't use it, then um, we stop talking to people. But but yes, I mean, this, yes, faith and belief, as you mentioned, is a key part, which goes back to like these intellectual kind of ideas of what a museum is about. Um, and I said, you know, for most people, like these are a devotional objects. I mean, the way these objects are made, they're not there to think about. They're there to experience through sort of a whole range of, of senses. You know, you'll kneel in front of them, you'll bow in front of them. I mean, these are sort of, you know, like embodied objects which are meant to be seen, if you like, from, I said, sort of from different angles. Um, and which if like, yeah, the whole body will be involved in. And of course, particularly in many places, incense would have been used. So, you know, your sight, your sense, your smell, touch, all, all of this um, will be coming into play. So, I mean, I think an understanding of like of how religion is, is embodied could really be brought in with museums when they're thinking about sort of displaying artifacts. So you don't just like sit and think, oh, this is about these ideas but thinking about, you know, this much sort of fuller sense of, of, of practice and embodiment and what this means in, you know, in, in doing religion, which of course, you know, most people don't think about religion, they do religion. Actually, you know, in, in the topic of kind of the lived experience of religion uh, kind of brings us to our next question by, from Christian Chong about how, you know, actually interreligious art uh, in, in society can, it, on one hand, while it may be able to spur dialogue and appreciation, it could also possibly stoke division as well? And is this something you, you, do you think art can also have this um, opposite effect? To, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, yes. Um, yeah, good, good, good question. I mean, there's lots of good questions here from, from our audience. Yes, it certainly can do. Um, I mean, there are, if you like, sort of some traditions which are quite sort of, uh, if you like, iconoclastic. They, you know, they, they don't believe in sort of these images there. Um, and as I've said, you know, particularly this term syncretism is very, it's very much a sort of a hot sort of topic. I mean, academically, I can say, yes, all religions are syncretic. Um, and I've immediately annoyed everybody by saying that <laughs> um, to, to, to some extent. So yes, I said, you know, pointing out these, these border crossings, it, it can create problems. Um, but I mean, as we've mentioned to some extent, because it's about art and it's in the museum, so it's this slightly safer sort of secular space, some of the tensions that might be there otherwise perhaps may be diluted through this. So if objects are seen as sort of art, you know, they're safer than perhaps talking about sort of doctrines and ideas um, for many people. Um, but, but yes, I said, you know, you will get, well, the Christian here has used the term sort of religious zealots, I mean, however you want to sort of talk about them. I mean, yes, you'll always get sort of hardline people who are, who are not open to any form of conversation or dialogue. Um, and of course, I mean, some museum exhibits have, have, have been vandalised or seen as sort of sacrilegious um, by certain people. But, you know, in as far as if like we're trying to sort of speak to a mainstream, then hopefully that sort of conversation can take place. And, and to some extent, you know, you can't double guess what particular, you know, extreme elements and traditions are going to take offence over. So it, yeah, it, it's sometimes hard to juggle that one. This is, it's just a constant process of trying to be sensitive and checking in with the relevant um, people and to try and yeah, always seek feedback, I, I would suppose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we, okay, we're kind of, uh, we're running uh, we're two minutes or so one minute to, to eight. So I'll just finish with one, one last question uh, or note uh, from, from Crispin Payne. Uh, who says he, he gathers that ACM is wanting to be more active in interpreting the religious nature of much of his collections in a way few culture museums yet are. Can you tell us any more? Um, and I think uh, speaking for, for the ACM, uh, it's something that we are still in the process of trying to figure out how to do, um, having just kind of completed the, the different museums, uh, the different galleries for dedicated to different kind of other religions. One. Um, I think one very important part of this process that we're doing is to try and engage more with, with uh, the actual religious communities on the ground and to find out what, how, how we can support them best. Uh, and, uh, you know, one very simple way that we're doing it is um, in, in our galleries, we're actually um, uh, having sort of small showcases 
that try to represent um, uh, religions, uh, you know, of the 10 major religions of Singapore that aren't really represented yet. So we are actively developing a, a case dedicated to, uh, to Sikhs in Singapore, to, to uh, Judaism in Singapore, uh, and to Zoroastrianism in Singapore, and, and hope to add uh, more as we go along. Um, and so, yeah, don't really have any, um, it's just something we're still trying to um, work through um, using this kind of com community engagement. Um, and as a kind of final question to Paul from for this, um, do, you, do you have any suggestions of, on how we can we can further this um, engagement with the religious uh, communities in Singapore? Uh, yes, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I think partly you have a current sort of temporary exhibition on where you've got people to pick out particular artifacts. And so like there's a personal sort of narrative. So at the back of, yes, the Faith and Beliefs Gallery, um, you know, you've got these stories around objects. And I mean, this, I think, sort of very much helps from taking this idea like that. This is like, you know, these are ancient statues or this is just simply art and talks, you know, about what it actually means to sort of real life people today. Um, so that's very useful. Um, and also, yeah, I mean, bringing the communities in, as I said, you work with these objects is obviously important. And I said, of course, you, you're doing that already. Um, but also, I mean, as far as it's possible, you know, of course, some of these galleries are sort of set up, but it might be possible, I said, you know, to make some changes around sort of the space or just to display a particular object. So, as I said, you know, like you get a sense, if you like, of it as a devotional object, which I said could be as simple as like it was placing it sort of high up. So you get this sense, you know, that's how you're meant to look at it. You know, you're all now facing up, which again, you know, it's not all wall to wall, it's like these bodily changes, you know, will make you think, well, what is this object and how am I relating to it? So yeah, I mean, there, there's all sorts of things that could be done. Great. Yeah, we, we actually have a, an exhibition, uh, a special exhibition plan um, for the end of, uh, of 2023, that, sorry, end of 2022, um, that we hope to kind of explore a few of these interreligious uh, themes and, and also the kind of things that Paul, you're talking about with uh, creative sort of, um, uh, uh, architecture within the galleries to, to kind of, uh, yeah, change the way you're looking at objects and, and so on. Um, but with that, it, it's a little bit after 8 p.m. So, you know, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much for your, your robust uh, participation in um, this, this talk. I'm sorry we couldn't get to everyone's questions. Um, but please, you know, if you have any comments or anything, um, type them into the, the, the feedback form you'll have for you later on. You can scan the QR code. Uh, and thank you, uh, Paul, once again, uh, for sharing your views with us. So, so yeah, so please uh, 